Hey, Steve. How's it going? I'm having one of those uh, days where I don't have a... Hey, Jim. Have a, uh, a toast, I guess. All about the coffee tonight. You ever have one of those days where you got to, like, play some guitar somewhere and you don't really... Like, you're doing a lot of stuff, but you don't actually, like, pick up the guitar and play, but you're doing all kinds of guitar stuff? That's kind of the day I'm having. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, actually, here's here's kind of a quick uh, throwaway thing. Not really throwaway, but... I like fake banjo licks. All right. So part of the trick to making a banjo lick work, I'm going to play um, the B on the fourth fret on the third string. It's got B, and then the second string is going to be open. That's also B, and the first string is going to be E. So this works great in the key of E, like if you're over an E chord. Alright, so I actually should probably turn off my distortion here for this. Kind of in tune. In tune enough. Um, also, is the sound good? I always, like, I, I never entirely know what's going on with the sound here. But the picking hand, there, there's a couple different patterns. The easiest one is you start with a pick on the third string. And it'll go ring finger on the first string, middle finger on the second string. This guy just does not want to be in tune. My tuner doesn't want to be my friend either. Okay. So the the idea here, and even if you're not playing like kind of, any kind of country music. Having that kind of banjo roll thing is kind of a cool thing to have up your sleeve for other other ideas. But a lot of it is just any kind of right hand picking pattern. It's just that I'm hybrid picking. I'm using the pick, and then I'm using my ring finger and middle finger, and they each have kind of a job. All right, so I'll start with the pick. Pick, ring, middle. Pick, ring, middle. Maybe I'll back up a little bit so you can kind of see a little bit better. You get used to that pattern, right? But that pattern, even though it's three notes, we're thinking 16th note. So one E and a two E. So I would turn the guitar volume up a little bit. I can do that. How's that? All right, so we're thinking one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. So what, what happens with this, the pattern of three is like my favorite thing where we have the odd number going over the even numbered subdivision. But you have to get used to keeping track of where the quarter note is. Because a lot of times when people have groups of three, they go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Like that. And that doesn't really work out so great. So even if I was to, let's put a metronome on here. It's all fun and games till someone put, sorry, I put out by a metronome. I'm assuming you guys can hear the metronome here. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. So let's slow it down a little bit. Bring it down to 60. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E. So you get this rolling feel. One E and so one E and a two E, a three E and a four E and a one E and. And the cool thing about this is once you get the right hand picking pattern, you can... You can play with chords. 
trick is keeping that pattern in time. All right. You can also do it. This picking pattern I like too. This is this is really more an authentic banjo kind of deal. Man, my E string doesn't want to be my friend today. Um, the picking pattern. Maybe do it in the time of the metronome would help. Right, I'm going one and a two E and a one. So what's going on there is I've got an eighth note with a pick. One and I'll go middle finger pick, ring, middle, pick, middle. And I just realized that if I was to write these out for you. Somebody's homework on here. I need to erase. So part of my my thought process is that you know a person shouldn't be just a pick player or just a finger style player. You know, um, I mean you can be just a finger style pick player because there's there's all kinds of music that does just that. But for me, the reality is that. If you're playing with a pick, pick is just part of how your hand hits the notes or articulates the notes. I wonder if we can do this where uh, here you go. That's a little bit better. Let's get rid of this thing. Nobody does that anyway. Um, so say if I'm talking about this this pattern here, the very first one. You're not able to see that, are you? Um, is this any better? You can see that decently enough, right? We'll go like that. So, and then rhythmically, one E and uh, two E and uh, All right, so you've got this pattern happening here, right? And let me highlight where the, this is where the pick is. And that's the beginning of the sequence, essentially. All right. And then when you get to this next bar here, so here's a bar line, right? Going one, oops, what did I draw here? One, E, and uh, Because we still have this idea where it's three over four essentially. Okay, the pattern is still rolling on into infinity. Okay, so that's that first pattern we we're just talking about. An E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a and with the metronome. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. So that's usually the first thing, kind of get used to that. All right, then the next idea. Um, turn that guy off. So I'm going to do. This is a little bit more complicated of a pattern because it's not straight sixteenth notes. It's just a two beat pattern. Oops, actually. Help of a 
was actually writing my notes in here. Can you guys read this? <laughs> All right, so the first part of this, one and a two E and a three E and. That's what we're setting it for is that, is that the hammer on. Try to do it too fast. All right, so the, that's the first thing. And then the second one is where we do this as straight 16th notes, but you've got a hammer on here. Right, and that hammer on is really important. All right, because you're not picking this note here. All right. But what this does, just in terms of being an exercise, is it gets you used to this idea that you're finger picking, and then you're also making, or manipulating, or articulating notes without the right, the left hand, the right hand doing anything. So you're getting a hammer on there. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E. Or else you go on one E and a two. What? Getting caught on the bridge. That's the first one. Second one. And then. And sometimes I'll use that hammer on one just as the beginning of a lick. Um, yeah, I'm not warmed up at all. You can even just move that around. And you kind of make whatever you want out of that. All right. Actually, not what I was planning on, on teaching today, but it just seemed like something fun to do. Are you guys all there? Let me know if you have any questions or anything else you'd, you'd rather be looking at. Banjo roll is just kind of a fun thing to do, but um, I do so much hybrid picking, you know, with the... Um, like all that kind of stuff that uh, even just getting started with even a simple banjo roll idea, it kind of stuff building this idea that you can use the pick and the fingers together. All right, and I'll do like, um, you guys familiar with Country Boy by Albert Lee? Now, I can't play Country Boy by Albert Lee, but there's one part, I think it's the bridge, where you... It's, so, it's something like that. And what he's doing here is he's taking... Um, if you're in E, right, obviously the first string is the open E. And he's got the seventh of the E, which is the D, and the third of the E, which is the G sharp. So it's D, G sharp, E. So having that open string kind of out of sequence and with the open string sound is kind of cool. And he does a slide in. And he, and he does the same thing a uh, frets lower. So it's, that's the E chord, all right? And then this guy here is the A chord. That's the third and seventh of the A chord. You go down a fret, it becomes the D chord. And you go down another fret, it becomes the G chord, right? So, but the cool thing is, is that the right hand, yes, yeah, we're still gonna do the piano, so I was kind of waiting for more people to show up, but I'll, I'll probably start doing the, the, the tune here in a second. I was just kind of killing a little bit of time. Uh, but anyway, but the, the banjo roll thing, the cool thing about it, is that, you know, as long as you get the right hand going, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing with the fretting hand. So, all right. You guys want to do some Tempted, and so do I. So let's do this a little bit differently.
the chart bill. So on Saturday morning, we did Somebody to Love by Queen. And I got a lot of tunes here. Um, and that was, that was kind of fun. This was the first tune I was going to do. I had to learn this for a, for a band a while ago. Um, and I really liked it. And it's one of those songs I always wished I could play on gigs and it was like, oh, I could never do that. Um, and then I realized actually it's not that hard to do. So the first thing is, you know, if we look at these chords here, all right, we're not we're going to use the, the chords, but we're not going to use the chords that they're talking about, right? So we're starting with the B. And we're going to tune because tuning is the kind thing to do. Now, if you're good with your triads that's one thing if you're not so comfortable with them I'm gonna drop a lesson here in the um, whoops you did not hear that um, I've got lessons on triads um, have you ever wondered what the unfortunately I gotta hear all my own talking here I would start with this one here. And then learning the fretboard. This is horrible. This is just talking about major triad shapes on the fretboard. That's part of our Cajun Beyond uh, thing. And then the next one here that, that's good for this is this lesson, which comes right after it, which we talk about turning these into major, minor, diminished, augmented triads. So bookmark those guys if you're getting a little bit lost on here. All right, so the first chord is B. And I, I cheated a little bit when I had to learn this. And I, I went and looked for some live versions of Squeeze playing it. And there was a, a really good video um, from Jules Holland, the Jules Holland Show, where um, uh, was it Paul Carroll, whoever, whoever the, the guy who sings it is, is playing guitar. And I really like the way he did it. You know, it's in the key of B. All right. So we're starting here with B major. And you'll see why I decided to play this in B. And maybe we'll work this out a couple different ways. All right. But this is the way that kind of worked the best for me. B major. And then the next chord is B over A. So all I'm doing is instead of playing that B is the lowest root, the A is now the lowest root. And then we have E7 over G sharp. Now... That guy there, and then, to be honest, to me it sounded more like this, where we're just keeping the B chord here. B, B over A, B over, uh, over G sharp, and then E. That's kind of what my ears were working on from there. If you're really to, to play what he's got there, that probably works really good too. Not how I did it though. Does it again. And then there's this this little thing here. It's a little piano lick, um, and it's really this is actually E. Like if you're playing the E shape right here to B. And then we got I got a toothbrush. So they've got it here. I don't know if I agree with these chords. F sharp over A sharp, G sharp minor. To me, I hear this as B. B with an A sharp in the bass. G sharp minor. And then when we go to the next chord, this chord really is C sharp over E sharp. And then E minor. All right. So the C sharp over E sharp, I'm playing the exact same chord as that, but on a different string set. Uh, where I'm playing it is, if you look at where this B is, this would be C, this would be C sharp. And then the E sharp is actually just F. So these notes here are the same as 
down there but this actually works better a lot of this is what does this sound like on my instrument these become the things that are important to me right so from the beginning of the the vocal part i bought a toothbrush a toothpaste a flannel for my face now b over g sharp is also g sharp minor seven so that's not really that much of a stretch pajamas a hairbrush new shoes and a case right so this chord to the e minor here works much better than if i was to use what's written there this guy to there if i was to play the what they've got i've got particularly care for those that much like that all right so back on my my route here i got a toothbrush a toothpaste a flannel for my face pajamas a hairbrush new shoes and a case uh now this chord right here this is one of those chords that makes it sound hip and what that is is basically we've been in the key of b major this whole time and he goes b minor seven oh okay Nice, cool little hip substitution borrowed chord. B minor 7. I said to my reflection, let's get out of this place. All right, so that chord there, F sharp minor 7. You could play F sharp minor 7. But whenever you got these chords where you've got all six strings, all right, and you, you've got notes on the fifth, sixth, and fourth strings together, it's too thick. I would rather hear this, especially when my amp gets loud, or if I'm using like some sort of chorus or phaser like I was doing on the gig. Okay. So Steve says that makes it sound like tears in heaven. Well, a lot of this is the, you know. A lot of the same idea. Right? Um you from the chord. I'm not entirely certain I understand that, but but yeah, I mean we're this is kind of a similar approach to things. Alright, so I'm on the F sharp minor seven. And we here's where we get into piano land. Alright, so you got G over A. So basically this is the G chord, which they've got written here. I'm um I'm not playing the note on the first string though. Alright, I'm playing D. B and G, and then I'm playing the A down here. There's a couple ways we could look at this actually, right? So you could do it here, because then you can get to the A real easy there, because that's the next chord. Um, you could also go G, A, but that doesn't sound right, or G, and then A, just leave the open A string ringing, right? It just depends on what you're going for. I like the control of having that fretted. I don't remember past the church and the steeple. So, okay, so here. Church and the steeple, the laundry on the hill, the billboards and the buildings, the memories of it still keep. Okay, so here's where I'm, um, I'm a little weird here. <laughs> um, I like going back. I don't play the E7. I just play an E major. And, the steep, and then the G, I'm actually playing just these open chords because they work in this context. Remember, I'm playing by myself. It's just me in a rhythm section. Laundry on the hill. B major, back to B major again. Billboards and the buildings. Mem memories of it still. All right, so here, A augmented with an E sharp in the bass. This is a fancy way of saying it's a second inversion A augmented chord. Um, the A, the plus means that the five is sharp, but they've also got the E sharp as the raised fifth. It's it's kind of confusing, but A. And then if you wanted to be really legal, you could do this, which is kind of difficult to play, but I'm playing F, F, and then the rest of the A chords, C sharp, A, F, and then F. Um, you could just not bother with this F and just play um, C sharp and A on the second and third strings and then the F right there. So you could go memories of it still. 
that would work because you don't have to play every note. You just don't have you don't want to play any note that doesn't belong there. All right, then we've got uh, B minor seven with F sharp in the bass. What they're playing kind of works. Notice that I'm I'm not like strumming everything, right? I'm using my right hand to pick everything, bass note and then chord. So it sounds a bit more piano style. So even though I'm playing what they've got written here for this B minor seven. Uh, with the F sharp in the bass, which is that's the fifth. I'm not doing that. That's too thick sounding. Sonically, we need to not play the fifth string. All right. So if I go back here, I end up having this. And calling, but forget it all. So a D over F sharp is a good old D over F sharp. We all know. And then they've got this G. Here's where these 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 charts kind of mess with you. If you play this, that note's really annoying. It doesn't belong there. I usually just play the F, and then I'll play parts of the G chord, which is the open G and D, and maybe the B. Because remember, these strings strings open are just G major, and there's the F. It's really just a G7 uh, with the uh, the seventh in the bass. So you got this. E and then there's an E with a D in the bass uh, I let the bass player play that right it's, it's possible to play too much stuff here so I'm gonna pause just for a second I'm gonna play through the whole thing and I'm gonna look at some questions oh wrote out in the sheet music yeah yeah okay I see what you're saying it sounds like tears in heaven if you use the chords voicings that are in the sheet music that I bought correct Um, turn on my magic coffee warmer here. F chord shape. Are you talking about like when I was doing this here? It's almost it's all al it's almost like a almost not quite because it's an augmented chord. It doesn't quite fit like that. Like F F A. Those are all F chords, but the C sharp. So I'd be like an F augmented. I know right there too. Okay, so let me back up. We'll take it from the beginning of the verse here. I bought a toothbrush, some toothpaste, a flannel for my face, pajamas, a hairbrush, new shoes, and a case. I said to my reflection, let's get out of this place. That's the church and the steeple, the laundry on the hill, billboards and the buildings, memories of it still keep calling and calling, but forget it all, I know I will. I forgot what the, um, yeah, that's where the bass plays. Then we've got the chorus. Tempted by the fruit of another We're tempted but the truth is discovered What's been going on Now that Huh? You Now that you have gone Alright, so here's, here's a point of contention with me Um the C sharp seven, I like that. This C sharp minor seven with an F sharp in the bass thing, I kind of like just playing F sharp seven sus right there because it kind of, I can play C sharp seven there and then the F sharp seven there. There's no other, and then I'm back in where I'm at. With the not strumming thing, a guy did a Christmas time here. Same right hand approach. Um, the thing about it being a jazz thing is, is the idea is that, um, you know, if I'm comping in a jazz setting, you know, regular strumming is, is too much. Where um, if someone's playing something, You want to um, you want to try and play things that are a little bit more 
fit in that piano space, all right? Or if you're doing something where it's like more chord melody, it fits. for playing Louis Armstrong. <laughs> All right. Hey, if you guys are just joining us, go ahead and let me know who's here. And if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. That's what we're all about. I'm kind of loosely going through this. A little bit of mayhem today. All right. If I was to... Actually, I don't have my chorus handy. Let me do something real quick. Um, we'll go phaser. Don't do this at home. You guys can all see that I'm bald now. It's awesome. In the last live stream, I talked about the fact that when I'm covering for a piano sound, I like to have something um, usually modulation wise that kind of fills space with movement so this is one of those um it's funny that i've got all these like really expensive fancy pedals but i really like this moore uh e-lady and it's supposed to be like a silver uh electric mistress pedal but that little bit of, of uh flanging just kind of makes everything move nicely right so even if i'm just playing this chord it's better than that just sits here. This actually has a little bit of movement to it. So if I start at the top, and I'll do it with the, with the modulation effect. I bought a toothbrush, some toothpaste, a flannel for my face, pajamas, a hairbrush, New shoes and a case I said to my reflection Let's get out of this place The church and the steeple The laundry on the hill The billboards and the buildings The memories of it still keep Still keep falling and calling but forget it all i know i will tempted by the fruit of another tempted but the truth is discovered what's been going on now that you have gone So let me let's let's back up just for a second. But on the verses, in reality, I really like to do the finger picking thing, All right? But when it gets to the chorus, I want it to, to pop more. So I'll actually play something that's a little bit more. <laughs> let me back up just for a second. Um, play some piano. Yeah, the right hands are important. I, I think it's important for everybody. Oscar says, were you playing White Room? Not yet, but we can. <laughs> wrong, uh, wrong effect. I do have a wah pedal here, but it's not plugged in. Um, I have to say, I'm not big on cheap pedals you can get on Amazon for 60 bucks, but this Moore 
E Lady pedal is is pretty awesome. I, I really have to say I didn't. That is great. I mean, considering that it um, it didn't cost three hundred dollars and. At least it makes me happy. <laughs> so, but that's like on Tempted, that's that's kind of the thing, you know, in order to make this work in a piano setting, a big part of this is, is setting the sections apart. And the first part is making sure that I'm able to actually place something that fills the appropriate space, doesn't occupy too much space and gets in the way of the vocal. All right, but then when we get to the chorus, You know, I'm actually able to kind of beat it up a little bit and then playing all pick kind of helps but like having like this kind of uh, picking pattern and I'm, if you watch when I'm picking this stuff the right hand is, is moving just like I'm strumming one and two and three and four If I didn't do that, it just wouldn't sit with the drummer very well. And I think that's that's vitally important with this stuff is to never forget that the drummer's the boss. Just don't let him hear that. <laughs> so let me ask you a question, guys. Um, when I switched to using the flanger, I randomly just plugged it in. I didn't even like mess with the settings. Could you hear a difference in terms of what I was doing spatially? Because I didn't like get all distorted with it. I mean, that's usually the first thing we do as guitar players. It's like, oh, clean is too small. Let's put distortion on it. Um, there's, <laughs> my delay is on, but like the the uh, mix is so low, you don't actually hear anything. Yeah, with a little bit of that, I don't know if you can hear that now. Having that little bit of delay now, that actually kind of kicks butt too. I have to admit, also I've got I've got a, one of those M drive. That's a it's just basically a boost, kind of fattening it up without it. I think most of us, and maybe Oscar can chime in on this. Um, how often do you just play straight clean without having? some kind of transparent like not even like a clon thing but a lot of times um if i'm strumming something like if i'm really like if i have to do this kind of rhythm guitar playing i'll play really clean but once i have to like i don't want to be distorted that or even like bringing the the volume down to me that is better than no pedal and guitar all the way up you know having that little bit of fatness you know even on like you know all right i don't know i just i really um I dig having something like that going most of the time, you know, just depending on what the what the tune is, uh, especially or if I'm playing something where it's, you know, a lot of single notes by themselves. It's not distortion. It's just it's like the fat <laughs> the fat pedal. Okay, so let's go back to the song for a second. Oh, actually, there's one thing I needed to talk about here at the end of the um, fruit of another. What's going on? Okay, at the end of the chorus. All right, so I'll back up for a second, and you'll hear it. Um, tempted by the fruit of another. Tempted, but the truth is discovered. What's been so this um, the C sharp chord here is um, it's a dominant chord and then we've got this uh, basically it's an F sharp suspended 7 sus 4 chord there's no uh, and that brings us back to the beginning and the second time tempted by the fruit of another you're a tempted 
it, but the truth is discovered. And then C sharp minor seven. All right. So what's going on there is I've got the C sharp minor seven chord right here on the fourth fret. And I'm playing the keyboard part. You know, that's like one of those things you can't get away with not playing that last little bit of melody because there's so much space there. So what's happening is I'm going to C sharp minor 7 and I'm just playing the melody on the second string with the pinky and then playing E minor 7, taking the same thing with the 7th fret, right? And that melody is on the second string and I'm... Yeah, I've got the back to the second verse, right? And it goes there. So if I take the, the second half of the chorus, it by the fruit of another, tempted but the truth, tempted but the truth is discovered. Oops, let me start at the beginning of the chorus. I'm blowing it here. I haven't played this in quite a while. Tempted by the fruit of another, tempted but the truth is discovered. Discovered what's been going on that you have gone. There's no other tempted by the fruit of another. Tempted by the truth is discovered. Here we are. Carousel. All right, and then and that's what happens at that part. And honestly, that's that's kind of the entire song. It's those two parts, and like the second verse gets kind of cut in half. But uh, I'd be happy like if I had to play this song on a gig, and I'm literally just faking this keyboard sound with a flanger, um, my Emerson M drive, fattening things up, and there's a little bit of my uh, Strymon El Capistan. And that creates a feeling of, of the space and the texture that you need to make a piano tune kind of work on guitar, I think. You know, especially with the rhythm section. I turned on the fat pedal a lot during COVID. You and me both. Yeah, you know what, what happens with this stuff is that we learn a lot of stuff and then we don't really learn it in the context of playing songs. And because we don't or our performing songs like maybe we'll learn something but we won't really get it together enough that it's it's um performable like in public <laughs> um you know and it's not till it's at, at that performable point that a lot of these things that you work on kind of come together and maybe they don't come together uh, as good as you want to in the beginning but that's kind of the the driving force between this stuff actually happening is is, is basically being able to um to work it up and execute it in, in a performance situation because there's a certain amount of stress involved there. it's almost like a little crucible you can practice all you want at home and you need to practice all you want at home but the reality is is that until you actually start having to perform music in a setting that's not just your dog or your cat um you know you're you're definitely not going to make the growth that you want to make um i have students all the time and i know people and sometimes i get in this mindset of like I'm not going to go do this thing. I'm not going to go play this gig or join this band until I'm ready. And the reality is, is you're never ready. It's like having kids. You know, you, you will never, ever, ever be ready for any of this stuff. You know, you can get certain things to happen right. I mean, there's certain things you need to do. But in reality, all the other stuff, you know, the, um, you know, the, the things that fill in the cracks and put it together, that all happens once you're under pressure and you have to actually make this stuff happen for real. So... Um, me, me for one, I'm very excited about, um, the pandemic ending and being able to go play gigs. <laughs> this is my, my weekly complaint about this, but uh, I just want to go play. Like, you know, I don't even really care. Like, like I need to make money and everything, but like, I, I need to go make music with, with good musicians more almost, you know? So you may see me playing a whole bunch of gigs of music I want to play, uh, with a bunch of my friends and be like, hey, we made enough money for tacos on the way home, <laughs> which is not how that's supposed to go. So that's one reason why my pedal board is, uh, is, is getting redone.
Okay, let me share with you guys. This is, uh, where can I find it? Um, maybe I have to be here. Get rid of that. Okay, so this is this is actually where my pedal board's at right now. I've got uh, everything figured out. I think these are the pedals I'm going to use and keep. And um, I got my stuff to make my cables. I'm actually instead of using the George L, the solderless stuff which I've used for close to 20 years, um, I'm actually going to make all new cables uh, and have them be soldered connections. Partially because um, having to figure out which one of your, your uh, cable ends got unscrewed on the on a gig is, is kind of a drag. It, mo it doesn't really happen that much, but um, it would be nice to just have everything be really concrete. And just cables, cables croak. So anyway, so that, that's, uh, I'll, I'll keep you guys up to date on that. Um, Oscar says, what is your quarantine practice schedule? Um, I wish it was organized. Um, I've been through a couple different phases and one of them was when this all started, I'm like, oh, I can practice four hours a day and I'm going to play, you know, I had this whole like thing. I was going to build repertoire in a bunch of styles. I was going to learn 10 jazz tunes. I was going to learn 10 uh, bluegrass tunes and I was going to, you know, I had these, these great plans after about three or four weeks and you, know, you realize that, you know, quarantine for this whole thing means you still have to earn a living. You still have to work. You still have to, you know, so in that regard, I've been going through phases depending on, on what I'm doing. Um, sometimes um, it's driven by what I'm teaching at the conservatory. Like I definitely want to make sure that I can play the stuff better than my middle school students. <laughs> um, if I'm working on, on something there, sometimes it's stuff that I want to be uh, teaching either on the live streams or making videos of. Um, Sometimes I just want to play some music, you know. I, I went from being very regimented about this to saying, you know what, um, I have to do certain things uh, for work, of which is, this counts as work, and then I also have to do certain things because I want to play music because it's fun. Um, and I've been doing a lot of recording. Uh, the backing track stuff's been fun. Um, I've been playing more bass and piano than I normally would just because I'm having to put all that stuff on the backing tracks. Um, the one I was playing earlier, it, it's, th it's things like that, right? So, um, a great example, in lesson, where you take the information you've learned in practice. not this, um, but as a, for instance, you know, I know that the backing tracks, the single chord ones are very popular on my web channel. Can you guys hear this? All right. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a uh, just an E7 backing track and then as we go through it, you know, playing bass um, In the case of this one, I really wanted some sort of funky clavinet thing. So I had to learn uh, basically how to play clavinet so that this, this part here All Right watch somebody else's video lesson Learned exactly how they, they did it. I played it and then I went in and <laughs> fixed it in the midi roll um, but, you know, it, it, it's kind of a different sort of journey right now. Um, I'm actually learning a lot. I think I'm growing a lot as a player, but part of it is because um, I'm giving myself different things to, to worry about. I, I've kind of gotten past this idea that I need to sit up and run scales every morning. Um, I get, like, right now I'm starting to run some scales and things right now because my that part of my playing has deteriorated a little bit, which I'm not real happy about. Um but for the most part, the biggest thing is, is keep making music, finding ways of making music. And I kind of have a certain amount of content to put out each week, and that's been kind of a good driver for me. You know, I want to make sure that I'm putting out backing tracks, whether it's the, the jazz stuff or whether it's the, the funkier things that people seem to like on the channel. Um, I've kind of been half-assed writing some original music, too, 
but it's not really been a focus. So I, I come up with an idea and then maybe I'll record it and then I'll stash it. Um, and who knows, that might turn into something later on once I've got a little bit more more time after the school year's ended. But uh, I think that's been kind of key because before all of this, I literally, you know, for me, I'd have to drive to school and, and teach, drive my kids around to work or to, to their schools. Um, you know, I've got gigs, so I need to learn music for that gig. And I'm, how many Rick Springfield tunes are you going to learn that are going to, you know, make you a better player after a certain point, right? So in a lot of ways, it's been frustrating because I'm not playing live and I don't have that driving my practice. Um, but I've kind of um, restructured for the current era and it's been it's been good for me. Um, just finding, you know, even if, if I couldn't do this, I would still try and like figure out ways of like collaborating with other people, recording or whatever. Oh. Let me do this in order. Jim says, think about getting an archer. I love my archer. It is the, I, I never liked those Klon kind of pedals before. And this one is really good. It, it's, um, it's fantastic actually. Um, I've had two or three other clone kind of pedals and I hated them all. Um, and uh, this one just is, I, I get it now, <laughs> you know, so if, if you're thinking about it, and the other thing I heard is that the guys from J rocket were the ones that were building the KTR pedals for the, the Klon guy, uh, when he first started making those. Um, so they basically are Klon circuits. It's the same as getting the, the, the KTR version, um, uh, for, you know, half the price. So, so I'm all about the Archer. I've gotten really into the J rocket down that rabbit hole. Uh, I really am I'm happy with uh, everything I've got. Steve needs a lower end schedule and practice outline. You know, the biggest thing is, uh, it's, it's more about playing every day than it is about having a regimented schedule, I think, when you're our age and you need, you know, you just need to keep going. Because the problem is, is that once you start regimenting your practice schedule, and it's like, I need to play this scale X amount of times a day, and then I need to run this song, you know. Um, your schedule's never going to allow that. Right? And then you run into these frustrations of like, hey, I just can't get anything done. I, I watch students do this all the time. I teach so many adults, and the biggest part of my job, I think, is frustration management counselor. And, and a big part of it is making sure that people understand that what they're doing um, – it's hard to fit it in time, you know, into your busy schedule. So you have to take the time that you get. And there are times where you've got an hour to sit down and practice. Cool. But the majority of the time, if you could just find five or ten minutes to sit down with the guitar and maybe play a song or, or, or run some scales or play a little bit of, of just noodling, that's fine too. Just keep your hands on the instrument. Um, have some, some goals in mind uh, for the long term. And when you do have more time, then work on that stuff. Then that's that's kind of the the best thing. You know, I I, had to, I went back to college, music school, in my forties. You know, when we've got kids and mortgage, and we just you know closed up our studio and everything. And the the reality was is that I didn't get to practice all that I needed to to be a music student, an undergrad music student. But I was still able to make it work. I found the things that I had to do, and um, and I got through it. But it wasn't the experience that it would have been had I been an 18-year-old going through music school, being able to hang out and jam with all my friends and going to all the open jam sessions and going to concerts and master classes. And I missed out on a lot of that stuff because it's just it's literally not possible. So you have to work with what the possible is. And this is the conversation I have with all of my adult students because all of my adult students run into these issues. Some people actually have had more time because they've been home for the pandemic. Um, and then other people, um, they're home more, but they're also <laughs> working more. <laughs> you know, they're filling that time with work. So you got to kind of figure, figure out what works for you. Between lawyering and getting sucked into the news. Yeah, you know what the best thing to do is, is to turn off the news. Um, that's um, it's important 
to a certain extent, but I know I get sucked into it and it sucks a lot of energy out of me. And uh, so, you know, a couple times a day I have to remind myself, like, let, you know, put the phone down, go, you know, get some work done. Because <laughs> it's, it's just the, 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 the mental overhead and stress doesn't do anyone any good. Yeah, anything, you have to figure out what works best for you and how you're going to organize your time. Because everyone's different. Everyone's got different obligations on their time. I don't have the longest attention span. I used to watch these um, Steve Vai, you know, his three-day or 100-hour workouts or whatever. And it's like, I just, I can't think that hard. I just don't have the brain power for it. I don't have the patience. Like, I know I can work on something for 30 or 40 minutes max and then I've got to take a break and I got to move on to something else so for me if I do that throughout the day like I'll find a little bit of time here a little bit of time there that's pretty you know maybe I'll, I'll get three hours of practicing in but it's not sitting down all at once you know for me it's uh, when I can find the time and then my brain is a little bit more fresher in order to uh, take in the knowledge so I like I like Oscar's deal Yes, David. Uh, exactly, I agree. Yeah, so for you, that you you found what works for you. And I think everybody kind of has to figure that out. Like, how are you effective in other parts of your life and apply that to your, your practicing? Because right? everybody is different, you know. I can, I can um, you know, for me, I can I can work this way. I know other people that need to have like a three or four hour block in the morning to practice. You know, and I just I wouldn't be able to make use of it that way. I'm literally just gonna play with this flanger all night. Let's um. Yeah, I agree. But I don't know where we got this idea that like we had to sit down and practice for eight or ten hours a day, especially music students. Um, most people just can't sustain that. I, I know I can't. You know. Um, but everybody's different. You know, you gotta you gotta figure out what works what works for you. Yes, message in a bottle. Um, the Iridium, I love. If you've listened to any, with the exception of the Paul Jacobs thing that I did, if you've listened to anything I've recorded and put on YouTube in the last exactly 12 months, it's all been Iridium. Um, I really, um, the thing that's great about it, and I think the thing that a lot of people don't like about it, it's literally just an amp. Like, there's nothing that exciting about it. But if you just want like the sound of like your amp in a room and you're going to put pedals in front of it, it's perfect. It really is. But um, I know a lot of people like like Mike Walters on the on the forum and a lot of those guys, they wanted to kind of have like the complete sound like, you know, with all the effects and everything. And uh, and I get that. So like like the Line 6, the Helix, the Kempers, things like that, um, they're good for guys like that. I just don't. I like how the Iridium sounds so far better than any of the other ones, and I've used them live. Um, mine has been living on my big pedal board um, since I got it, and it's literally set up so that I've got the one in, one output of my pedal board is going to the amp, and then the other output is, is through the Iridium in a direct box into the PA, and then that runs the... Um, in your monitors for everybody or the 
you know, the wedge monitors if that's what we're doing. And if my amp goes down, say that uh, some moron named Mark um, puts a drink on top of it and it drips into my hot tubes and cracks them, which has happened in the last five years, um, or any manner of other things, I can always plug in and, and finish the gig out, um, which is fine. I've, I've had a couple of, of uh, times where, not since I've got the Iridium, but with in other situations, other situations where I've had to like do that. So now I've got the Iridium, it's actually a little bit more more doable. Um, I'll be honest, I use one sound. I use the punch, which is the Marshall sound with the Greenback 412, totally stock. Um, it's clean, I run the Marshall clean. I like it better than the Deluxe, which is really weird. Um, I haven't ex played with, and I bought a bunch of the Celestian IRs and haven't even tried to put them in the in this yet. I've, I've used them with um, Positive Grids Bias. I've used that the, for the Paul Davids thing and for a couple other other things. Um, but the, the Iridium is, is great for what it is. And it's literally, it's three classic sounding amps. If you're really wanting to sound like Tony Iommi or, or Steve Vai or Van Halen or ACDC, it's not going to do any of that stuff. Um, but if you're the kind of guy that I am and, and kind of like you are Oscar, cause I've played gigs with you where, you know, you're playing through your bitchin' old fender and, uh, you're putting pedals in front of it. It's, it's, <coughs> it's not bad. You know, it's not bad at all. And you can hear that. Like, uh, I don't know if you saw the, um, I just put this video out yesterday. It's the, um. The Andy Woods uh, Woodshed Compressor. I'll put the link here. Um, so that's all Iridium. And then... Um, back up just one more. Um... Oh, this one here. This is all Iridium as well, with different pedals in front of it. All right. So those are those are two good examples of um, uh, of things that I've done with the Iridium. I think that that I'm, I'm real happy with. Okay. Yes, Steve I is the culprit. You know what? If you're happy with your M9, then use your M9. I had an M9 a few years ago, several years ago actually now, and I hated it. But if you look on the boards of most of the the Nashville session guys and even some of the LA guys, they love those things. They, they use them a lot. Um, I don't know as much anymore, but... Um, uh, Tom Bukovac, Sean Tubbs was using one for a long time. Um, Tim Pierce, like a lot of those guys were, were using it for effects. One of the things though is that um, they were also getting them modified. I don't even know how you would get that modified, but that's one of those deals. Um, but if you're happy with your phaser, don't mess with it. We don't need to keep buying shit. When I was a little kid, my parents wanted to be the next Myron Florin. Yeah, when you're forced to practice, then it kind of kills it. And believe me, I know because I teach in a music conservatory. <laughs> um, one of the best uh, music conservatories in the state of California for um, for high school kids. So. Yeah. That's, it's always hard when the parent wants it more than the kid does. Or the parent thinks they know more about it when the kid is actually the one who's passionate about about what's going on, and that ends up becoming another another avenue I kind of have to uh, navigate when <laughs> when I'm dealing with uh, the frustration of, of students, you know, and what they're able to do or what they're not able to do in terms of practicing and their and their you know what they're achieving that way. 
So, hey, guitar questions. Let's do some guitar questions. You guys got anything uh, you're interested in? I did the uh, the banjo rolls and hybrid picking earlier. It's Telecaster Day, so that's fine. <laughs> losing my pick. This is for my wife as she's watching. Yes, I, I used your box, your plastic box for picks. <laughs> um, Terry, who's usually on here on the forum and also one of my students and, and friends, um, says he play, hates playing an E. Absolutely, Jens Larson is awesome. Jens Larson is definitely a, a good good channel. Um, let's talk about ways that you can play thick lines uh, in the open position real quick. All right, so you got this E chord here. All right, and because we're in the key of E and the guitar has so many E's and B's in it, uh, like we had our banjo roll from earlier. All right, I can use that first string as a drone for a lot of stuff, right? So like the Jimmy Vaughn. Right. I love that, that sound where you're basically taking the note on the second string, sliding into the, the same note as the first string on the fifth fret, and then going down to the third fret, which is the D, which is the minor seven. And then you got the, the B right there, right? This part of it, I'm, sli I'm hammering onto the third, so it's like E. Remember, we always approach the third from a half step below on bluesier things. And then I'm hybrid picking the second and first strings. You can also grab the second fret, which is the sixth. Right there, this is playing a blues scale there's the flat five All right so much of this works because you've got notes that are in the the one chord or in the e and you're just playing stuff against it neither they're in the scale or they're against it All right but you're able to use that dissonance to your your advantage all right so if, if you're coming in late, uh, go to the beginning of the video. I do banjo rolls in this position. All right. Um, you've got the basically the idea of the drone string with the E notes on the first string. All right, still an E. This is B, which is the fifth of the E. This is G, which is the, the minor third of E. And we've got that, um, you know, approaching the, the third from a half step below. All right, so here, we've got the fifth and the third of the E chord here. There's your third, there's the G again. This is the six, but together. All right, so I'm basically going from bending that guy up to playing those two strings open. All right, and then we've got this bit where I'm, I'm approaching the third from a half step below. So the second string's open, third string is hammered on onto the first fret. But the good movement right before that is the. Um, the A and the C sharp, so that's like the A chord. We can also do this guy here. This is the the fifth and the minor seven and E. All right, so all of that stuff right there just gives me these really thick ideas. Right there, you can take that the sixth, which is the second fret. Bend it up a half step and then play the first string. There's another one of those where I'm basically playing first string, which is E. 
playing the second string, second fret, which is the sixth at C sharp, and then I'm taking the flat five, which is B flat, and bending that guy up so it's the B. Yeah, adding that bend in there, because remember here, right, when we were talking about the uh, Albert Lee stuff, still kind of do that sort of thing too with it but you're bending instead of doing the hammer on and that's the articulation I love those smears <laughs> right there All right so I've got the E E so E is on the uh, second string fifth fret open E and I'm taking the, the C sharp the sixth from down there it's on the third string now and bending it up a half step. All right, and then that guy just changed the pattern a little bit. So uh, I'm on the 12th fret for both of these. All right, and basically I'm just taking the, the G on the third string, going up a half step, I'm doing the same thing, maybe ending on the harmonic. Anybody following that? <laughs> Discipline. Yeah, I mean that's honestly this this idea that you're you're on a bit of a schedule. Um, that's one reason why you pay for lessons. You know, is because then every week you're like, oh shit, Mark's gonna give me a bunch of crap <laughs> if I don't have something to show. It at least keeps you moving forward. Back to the open E thing. Um, the biggest thing I love about the open E thing is that it's just it's full of open strings that we can cheat with. Um, yeah. All right. Basically, that's just um, E minor pentatonic blue note. All right. That's kind of a cool sound. Adding the hammer on. That's a combination of the blues scale and heading around to the third. Cool. I'm going to pause for a second, have a drink. So you guys have a question. Well, I feel like I'm starting to warm up. Um, pulling off chords. Yeah. All right. Basically, that's just an E triad right here. Let me um. So you can see more of the top chord. Getting everything but what I need here. There we go. Okay, so you can see the whole guitar now. All right. So this is just E major. All right, G sharp, B, and E. All right, I'm using these two fingers. Then the whole thing pulls off, and then I come back on there. It goes by so quick, you don't hear the weird notes, so. All right, a lot of this is, um, you play 90% of the notes in key. <laughs> and you play quick enough the other 10% of the notes don't count that's something I learned from like learning Brad Paisley and uh, Albert um, Albert Lee stuff is that you know not every note has to be justifiable as long as it's in time and the majority of it defines the harmony <laughs> C 
sixth chords are also your friend. Kind of sounds a little bit more pedal steely, right? So, like right here in E, I'm playing an E, and I'm basically playing a C sharp minor triad. And C sharp minor also happens to be E sixth, because the notes in, in this shape are the third, the sixth, and the root of E. If you move them down chromatically down a whole step, right, then you also got the, that's the seven, the five, and the nine. And this guy's like you're playing like kind of a blues stormy Monday kind of deal. These notes here are the chord tones, root, three, six, and you end up here, which is seven, nine, and five. And as long as the E's still going there, all of this still sounds like you're in, you know, you're in the key. That's just down a uh, I actually learned that from a Joe Satriani tune, believe it or not. Alright, so um, harp scales are also fun. I'll go through this one slow so you guys can like rewind this here, but in A7, basically I've got A, and then this is C sharp and E. That's the uh, fourth fret and the second fret. And that's the open G. I'm hammering on on the fifth string. And then I'm hybrid picking those two notes. So this is basically going up an A7 arpeggio. Okay. Root, three, five, minor, seven. And usually I'll end up doubling up the G right here. So it's, it's the seven and the five there. And then to cap it off, what you can do is you can slide into uh, the C sharp, which is the third from a half step below, and then in on the root. Ugh. Okay, how are you guys doing? Um, I'll probably go for another 10 minutes or so if you guys have things you want to learn or you want to hear me ramble about my half-assed country playing which is definitely not good country playing but it's uh but the nice thing about it is i can kind of bs my way through a lot of stuff so if i'm playing over a blues um let's go um I'm in the key of E. I've been doing this so uh, blues in E. Let's see if we have kind of a Chicago shuffle blues in E. It's like one of those twist ones.
out of gas. But you can use a lot of that stuff. I mean, that's the thing. New comments. Ooh, that says me reloading. Do I have any country in my bucket? I've been uh, playing pretty much what's in my bucket. <laughs> it's all of my country. Oh, hybrid picking. I'm good with cheating. I'll, I'll be real honest with you. Anything that gets me through the day, it's fine. It's a sin in the church of Demiola. Well, here's the thing is that I can't play any of that Demiola. The... Like all that really super fast picking stuff. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not good at it. I can kind of mess around with it, but like, but let's do it totally inappropriately here. thing I just ain't got. <laughs> it's not, not in my wheelhouse. So I, I have to say that I, I went most of my life without really, um, I've owned Telecasters and never really liked them. I had, my, I had a Sir Telecaster, had a couple other ones over the years. Um, this one actually um, is what everything else wasn't though. It's got such a great bridge pickup sound. The neck pickup is, is awesome. Yeah, I can get away with it. I can roll the... With the right pedal, I can I can kind of crunch out a little bit. It even likes that Sir Riot distortion pedal for some reason. Um, I can play most of a, a cover gig night with this, and then at a certain point, I have to bring out the Les Paul or, or my McFeely with the humbuckers or something. Um, a certain part of the night, this just doesn't quite cut it. But man, it covers a lot more than you would think. A good Telecaster's got some huevos. And um, so this is kind of my... My, my happy place most of the time. I'll turn off my M drive. But, um, Oscar and some of the other guys will remember that whole thing that used to go on at, at Harmony Central about the, the Telecaster being the polygraph of guitars or some other nonsense. The reality of it is for me is that, um, I have to be more accurate with it. I can't get away with being sloppy on a Telecaster. I mean, there may be a little bit of something to that, you know. Um, I, I just, when I play my Les Paul, or I don't know, my Les Paul's very forgiving. My McFeelys are, are, are more forgiving. Uh, the, the Paul Reed Smith is, is really easy to play. Um, this guitar, man, I have to have my crap together. But I like it. Make it even. Ah, I'm doing too fast, but. exactly how I don't have my shit together on that too. <laughs> so. All right, guys. I think, 
I think it's a good time to wrap it up. It's, uh, we haven't quite finished binge watching Gilmore Girls with my daughter. <laughs> so, so, uh, unless you guys have any other questions, I am going to, uh, wrap it up for the evening. But I want to thank you guys for hanging out. I hope, we'll, I hope this was helpful and useful. I was a little schizophrenic tonight. Um, that somehow went from piano tunes to my really crappy country, pseudo country playing. Uh, and I'm glad that you guys were around for it. So, thanks a lot. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>